Hi, everybody. So we're going to, um, yay, it's time for environmental organic chemistry. Are you excited? I'm excited. OK, uh, so this is the uh, review lecture on thermodynamics and kinetics of transformation reactions. And this should be review for most of you. This should be stuff that you've covered before in Gen Chem and, and maybe even in organic chemistry. Uh, but we're going to go over it here. Um, you know, I know not the most exciting thing. But toward the end of the lecture, we're going to talk about the steady state reactor, the one box model. And that's really important. And it's possible that that's not review, probably not something you get in your chemistry classes. Um, Dr. Miskowitz might talk about it in Phaeton Transport, but it might be new to a lot of you. So bear with me, get to the boring stuff, and then we'll get to the good stuff. So uh, for the first half of this semester, we've been talking about stuff that is equilibrium processes that are at equilibrium, partitioning processes, excuse me, that are at equilibrium. And in those processes, the chemical itself was not being transformed. It was just moving from air to water to octanol to natural organic matter or whatever. But there were no bonds breaking or forming. Now, in the second half of the semester, we're going to start to talk about reactions where bonds do break and form. And we're going to talk about three general types of chemical reactions. The chemical reactions. Uh, chemical reactions means any kind of bond breaking or forming reaction. But when I use the word chemical here, I mean abiotic chemical reactions. Uh, then we're going to talk about photochemical reactions, reactions with sunlight or with um, chemicals that have been produced by the effects of sunlight. And then we're going to talk a little bit about biological processes. Now, you know, we have an entire class on biodegradation and bioremediation, which I highly recommend to you. Great class. So we're just going to hit the highlights here. We don't have time to go into a whole lot of depth on the biological reactions. So uh, you know, we're considering the fate of our chemical in the environment. So we need to think about some, some important questions. Can this compound be transformed? Is there some pathway for it to be transformed? If so, what are the reaction products? Sometimes the reaction products are just as toxic or even more toxic than the starting materials. Uh, TCE and PCE in groundwater can frequently become dechlorinated down to vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride is more toxic than TCE and PCE, so we have to consider the reaction products. Similarly, DDT in the environment reacts to form DDE, which is still toxic and still problematic. Um, and then you sort of stall out there and the DDE persists for a long time. You need to know something about the kinetics. Is this a fast reaction, in which case I could forget about the, the, the starting material and just worry about the product? Or is it slow and it occurs over a long time? Um, you can use the DDE to DDT ratio as a way of estimating how long that DDT contamination has been in the environment. So knowing something about the kinetics is important. And then we also need to ask questions like, is pH uh, important? Does the intensity of light affect the reaction? What about the redox conditions, the ionic strength? Uh, are all of these things important in terms of changing the products or the kinetics of the reaction? All right, so we spent the first half of the semester thinking only about thermodynamics, and everything was at equilibrium. And then we had a little interlude where we talked about a chemical reaction, but it was a proton transfer reaction. It was acid-base chemistry. An acid-base chemistry can be assumed uh, to be at equilibrium. It's fast and, and reversible, so we could assume that that whole process was at equilibrium. Now we're going to start to think about chemical reactions that are not reversible and that are on the slow side, so we need to think about kinetics. And uh, we, we generally no longer need to worry about equilibrium because the kind of chemical processes that we're going to talk about don't generally come to equilibrium. So yeah, I have to show you some Greek symbols. Bear with me. All right, so the chemical potential. Remember, all along, we've been using this idea of chemical potential mu. And it's equal to the chemical potential of the, the chemical in its reference state, mu naught, plus this correction factor. And the correction factor has to do with the concentration of our chemical I in its reference state. That's the reference, so that's in the denominator. And then in the numerator, you have the actual concentration of the chemical in your system multiplied by its activity coefficient. OK, and so the delta G of the compound, the, the excuse me, the chemical potential of the compound here is, by definition, that's what the three, uh, three lines here mean. By definition, it's equal to the delta G of formation of the chemical in the aqueous system, because we're going to use the aqueous uh, system as our reference state. 
So with our general ver reversible reaction, I'm sure you've seen this. You might have seen using different symbols, but the idea here is that you have chemical A and you have lowercase a molecules of chemical A, so maybe one molecule of chemical A, one molecule of chemical B, one molecule of P, and one molecule of Q. Uh, you can have these reactions occurring and the delta G of the reaction is the chemical potential of the products minus the reactants. So here's the products, that's why they have plus signs in front of them, and here's the reactants, and they have negative signs in front of them. So that's the delta G of the reaction, and because we know that we can use this equation for the chemical potential of each individual species, we can rewrite this equation in this form. So here's the, the chemical potentials of all the, uh, the reactants and products in their um, reference state plus RT natural log and then this is the big fat correction factor for the fact that all these things are not at their reference state. And so you have each of the products and reactants, you have their concentration multiplied by their activity coefficient to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient. Okay, and you got that four times your product, product, reactant, reactant. You know, if we had more products and more reactants, the additional products would go up here and the additional reactants would go down there. So you've seen something like this before, but you probably have never seen it uh, with the activity coefficients explicitly put in here. So the reaction quotient is this thing. And remember, we can write, if we have the, act if we have the concentration multiplied by the activity, we can write that in this form with these squiggly brackets. Okay, so the squiggly brackets just are referring to the fact that it's concentration times activity. So this is the activity of product P to the P power times the activity of product Q to the Q power and etc. And this thing is the reaction quotient. Okay, and when you're in equilibrium, the delta G of the reaction is equal to zero and the reaction quotient is equal to the equilibrium constant, capital K. So these, these reactions have equilibrium constants. Now a lot of the chemical reactions that we're going to talk about go to what we would call completion, which means that the concentrations of the products are ginormous. They're huge compared to the concentrations of uh, the reactants. And so K is, is huge. It's so big that it's like kind of pointless to even calculate it. Okay, so like all equilibrium constants, the equilibrium constant for the reaction can also be a function of temperature. And just like all the equilibrium constants we saw in the first part of the semester, we can use this kind of an equation to calculate the equilibrium constant at different, different temperatures. Typically, we start with the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees C, and we correct it to some other temperature by knowing the delta H of the reaction. Now the difference is that the enthalpies of these chemical reactions can be much, 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 much greater uh, than those of phase transfer processes. So for uh, delta H of vaporization, we said that that's usually got the highest delta H and it might be somewhere from, anywhere from maybe 20 on the low end up to 100, 120 kilojoules per mole. Uh, but for chemical reactions, we can have delta H terms of 300 kilojoules per mole. You know, we could have huge, huge delta H terms here. So how does that equilibrium stuff that we've just talked about have anything to do with kinetics? So for re chemical reactions, we can always write a rate law, which is a mathematical function that describes the turnover rate, that the, the DCDT, the change in concentration with the change in time of the chemical of interest as a function of the concentrations of the various species participating in the reaction. And these rate laws may or may not have a theoretical basis. Some of them do, some of them do not. Um, for our purposes, we're most always going to be considering either truly first order processes or pseudo first order processes. And those do tend to have a theoretical basis. But sometimes you'll be reading the, the literature and you'll find something here and it, the rate law will contain like protons, Boy, this is really bad. You can tell I'm using a, a really cheap ass mouse. Protons to the like 0.15 power. You know, so that's that's clearly not have, doesn't have a theoretical basis to it, right? Whenever you see a weird exponent like that, that doesn't have a theoretical basis. Uh, and you might expect that for something like protons, because what you're saying here is that the chemical reaction is dependent on pH. 
Okay, yeah, big, big duh. Okay, so yeah, the chemical reaction depends on pH, but not in a really clearly defined way, in a kind of a weak-ass way, which is why the coefficient here, the, the um, power, is only, you know, something small like 0.15. Uh, that's the kind of thing you see more often when you're looking at uh, biological reactions, you know, microbial reactions. But if we're just looking at chemical reactions, we usually are able to write a rate law that has a theoretical basis, and it will be of this form, dA, dt, so the change in the concentration of chemical A with time is equal to the negative of some rate constant, and the rate constant is now a lowercase k, not uppercase, lowercase k for rate constant multiplied by some concentration term to an exponent and then maybe there's other concentrations of other species that are also important in the reaction. Now like I said in our world in the world of this class we're gonna keep it really simple and we're just gonna have either pseudo first order or truly first order reactions so we can ignore all of this and that exponent will be one and we're gonna have a much simpler rate law that looks something like this. Okay, but in, in uh, more complicated kinetics, you might have uh, more complicated rate laws where you have several superscripts here, A, B, and C. Um, and so the overall reaction order would be the sum of all of those. So if it's first order with respect to A and first order with respect to B and first order with respect to C, then its overall reaction order would be one plus one plus one would be three. But that kind of chemical reaction is way too complicated for me. I can't do that math, so I don't worry about it. I just stick with pseudo first order reactions. So here we are with our first order reactions. So the rate law for these is dA, dT, or whatever concentration, whatever chemical here in A, but the change in the concentration of your chemical by, over time is equal to minus K, the rate constant, lowercase k, times the concentration of A. And so um, I, if you remember your calculus, you can integrate this from time zero to time t, if you want to integrate that reaction, that equation, and you get this equation, uh, the concentration of A at time t is equal to the concentration of A at time zero times e to the minus k, the rate constant, times t, the time. And we can also calculate the half-life, so the half-life of this chemical reaction, t one-half, is the natural log of two divided by the rate constant. The natural log of two numerically is 0.693 divided by k. So this is an important equation that I promise you, you will use when you do the homework. All right, so that's a truly first order reaction. All this math applies when we have a really truly first order reaction. But in the real world, mostly what we have is second order reactions, but we describe them as pseudo first order reactions. So the way we get away with doing this is that in truth, the rate constant, the rate law, excuse me, is something like this. dA dT is minus, equal to minus K times the concentration of A and the concentration of B. But if the concentration of B is not changing over time, then B is basically constant. And we could wrap B into this, into the, the um, rate constant here, and just give it a, give it a little apostrophe to denote the fact that it's a pseudo first order rate constant. So K is equal to K prime, the K with the apostrophe is equal to the old second order rate constant multiplied by the concentration of B. So let's do a little dimensional analysis here. DA is the change in the concentration, so that might be in units of molar, right, right moles per liter, divided by time, so maybe that's in seconds. So molar, of course, is moles per liter, if you want to write it out that way, or capital M for molar. Uh, so each of these, B and A and B, have units of moles per liter. I gotta get a better tablet for writing, this is really sad. So each of these have units of moles per liter, so then what are the units of K? Hmm, let's think about that for a minute. The units of K, well, you have to have one over time here somewhere. So there's your one over time, time in seconds. And one of these mole per liter stays, because it's still present over here, but one of them goes away. So one of them has to be, uh, has to disappear, which means that you have to have a liter per mole here. So that this liter per mole will ca cancel out with that liter per mole. This one stays, and you get mole per liter per second for your DADT. That's cool. Uh, then would we convert this into a pseudo, so this is for a second order rate constant. 
second order. This is just tedious and awful to watch me do this, right? Second order rate constant, lowercase k. But if we convert it into the first order rate constant, the first order rate constant here, this still has units of moles per liter, and DADT still has units of moles per liter per second. So that must mean that the units of K here are just one over seconds, one over time. So that's one of the tip-offs. If somebody gives you a rate constant and it has units of one over time, then you know it's a pseudo first order rate constant. If they give you a rate constant and has units of liters per mole second, then it is not a first order rate constant. It is a second order rate constant. All right, so um, you can describe the concentration of A at any given time as the concentration of, of A at time zero minus K prime T. And same as for the regular, um, regular first order process, the half-life is still natural log of two divided by K. So if we consider an example here, we have, um, this is an aldehyde, okay? Right here, this is an aldehyde. And then um, what can happen is that the water molecule comes over and attacks right here where the carbon is. Uh, and you get this thing where the water molecule is attached. So here's the OH and the extra H is now up here and you have a diol, uh, two alcohols, so a diol, it's called a geminal diol. Um, and we're, because water is the solvent, its concentration never changes, so we just sort of forget about it. And we just have the aldehyde A as the reactant and the diol D as the product. So DA, DT, the rate at which A is disappearing is the rate at which A is disappearing. So here's the concentration of A multiplied by the rate constant K1, because that's the rate at which it's disappearing. Disappearing, so it has a negative sign. And then the rate at which it's appearing is the amount of D multiplied by K2. So this is the rate at which the aldehyde is appearing, and that's why it has a positive sign. We can draw exactly the opposite uh, uh, rate constant, rate law, for the diol, dd dt, is equal to plus k1a minus k2d, right? Because this is the rate at which d is appearing, because it's the amount of a multiplied by the rate constant that makes a disappear, uh, times, and then minus the amount of d that's disappearing, which is the amount of d that's available, times k2. So at equilibrium, we know that products over reactants, d over a, has to be equal to the rate constant, but at equilibrium, both of these are equal to zero, right? So if we set these two reactions equal to zero and we do the math, we find out that D over A is also equal to K1 over K2. So it's the rate of the forward reaction over the rate of the back reaction. So voila, not only is the equilibrium constant telling you something about the concentrations of the reactants and the products at equilibrium, but it's also telling you something about how fast the forward and the back reactions are. So it's important to understand that that equilibrium constant is telling you something about equilibrium concentrations, but also about the rate of the forward and the back reaction. So if the forward reaction is really fast, so that K1 is big, uh, and the back reaction is slow, the, so the K2 is small, then the overall equilibrium constant will be really big. And that's saying that we're going to get mostly D at equilibrium and not very much A. So for example, if the aldehyde here, remember this is some generic aldehyde, but if we have a specific aldehyde, let's say it's formaldehyde, uh, then K1 is about 10 to the 10 per second, and K2 is about 5 times 10 to the minus 3 per second. So the equilibrium constant is about 2,000. So at pH 7 and at equilibrium, you have 2,000 molecules of the diol for every one molecule of the alcohol. And in fact, this is true, in case you care, it's true that although we write these um, chemicals as though they're really aldehydes, the way the existence solution is really as these geminal diols. Not that that's important. Uh, okay, and there's one other thing that we can calculate, which is the time to steady state. So we could say that the time to steady state is the time it takes to go 100% to equilibrium, but we would never get 100% to equilibrium. We never, that that's, you know, theoretically takes infinity. So what we'd calculate instead is the time it takes to get 95% of the way to, to the conclusion, which is 0.05. 
95%, 0 0.5, or 5% remaining, which is 0 0.05. The natural log of 0.05 is, only, is exactly 3, so that's convenient, right? Um, so just like the, the half-life is the natural log of 2 divided by the rate constants, this is the natural log of 0 0.05 divided by the sum of the rate constants. In this case, it turns out to be that the time to steady state is only 0.3 seconds. So you add this stuff to solution, and by the time you're, you're done stirring, it's come to equilibrium, or at least it's come to steady state. Okay, so that's a regular old chemical reaction, and we all know that in the environment we tend to have these catalyzed reactions, especially in uh, microbial systems or living systems. We have enzymes, and enzymes are catalysts. Catalysts are things that make the reaction go faster. They don't change the reactants of the products. They are not themselves consumed, but they just make everything faster, which is another way of saying that they lower the activation energy. And so the rate law uh, for these catalyzed reactions, DADT is quite complicated, uh, and the, the rate as a function of the concentration of the chemical is not just a straight line, which is what it would be if we had just pseudo first order reaction kinetics. The straight line here would be our slope, which would be our, our rate constant. But when you have catalyzed reactions, you get something that's not a straight line, you get these different lines here. And they might be looking a little bit familiar to you because this is basically the same math as uh, the Langmuir absorption equation. Because you, in the Langmuir absorption equation, you have a limited number of sites to which the chemical can absorb. In enzyme kinetics, you have a limited amount of enzyme to which the compound can can attach before it then goes on to react. So you still have something happening at a limited number of sites. And so the math turns out to be quite similar. So DADT is equal to minus, and here we're using the, the letter J. You've probably seen michaelis Benton kinetics written with different letters, that's fine. We're using J here, it doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, multiply by the concentration of your chemical in the numerator, and then in the denominator, you have the concentration of the chemical plus this other thing, um, uh, this other uh, term, which in this by this notation is J over K. So at low, low concentrations of A, when A is really small, this A is much less than this. So we could, we could ignore it. And if we do that, then these J's cancel out. And DADT, this is in the denominator, so it flips over into the numer numerator. And DADT is equal to minus KA. So it just collapses onto pseudo first order reaction kinetics at low concentrations of A. But then at high concentrations of A, this is much bigger than that, and we could ignore that part. And then these cancel out, and DADT is just equal to minus J, right? Which is another way of saying it's zero order. It doesn't matter how much A you have, it's going to go at rate J, period. That's as fast as it can go, cannot possibly go any faster. OK, um, so that's the michaelis benton kinetics. Um, I just went over all the same stuff here, so really no point in going over this slide. Same idea, that you have a maximum rate at which the, the reaction can go. If your substrate is well, well, well below that concentration that would saturate the enzyme, then you have pseudo first order kinetics. But as you approach the high concentrations of your chemical that saturates the enzyme, then you approach zero order kinetics. The reaction cannot go any faster. Um, so the... Um, Temperature dependence of these lowercase k, the rate constants, are dependent on activation energy of the reaction, right? So um, the uh, activation energy is analogous to the delta H of an equilibrium process, except that this is not equilibrium. We're talking about kinetics now. So the rate uh, at which the chemical process moves forward is related to its activation energy, and that will describe how it changes with temperature. And the thing is uh, that these activation energies are really, tend to be really, really big. So here, you know, this is just an example, 40 to 130 kilojoules per mole. I mean, they could theoretically be infinite, but if they get much bigger than 130 kilojoules per mole, then the reac reaction is just so slow that you don't need to bother with it. But the point is that they're big, and they're usually bigger than the delta H terms for phase tra transfer processes. So reaction rates are very, very sensitive to temperature. Okay, this is where we get to the good stuff. 
So in the world of environmental science, we want to model what happens both in natural systems like lakes and rivers and even in the ocean. And we also might want to model what happens in uh, what, what, the, what the Brits would call purpose-built systems or engineered systems like wastewater treatment plants, okay? And to do that, the simplest way to attack that problem is to draw a box around your system and say, okay, this box, right, here's my box. This box is going to define the extent of my system. And if you're talking about a lake or a tank and a wastewater treatment plant, usually your system is bounded by the water. The water is the system. And wherever the water stops is where the system stops. Okay, so uh, within our box here, we can utilize a mass balance, which is, you know, just saying that mass is never created and it's not destroyed, right? Mass can never be created or destroyed. So um, you have an input of your chemical, which is here, the input I, and then you also have a flow rate of your liquid, which for us is going to be water. If the volume of this box isn't changing, then the flow of water coming in has to be equal to the flow of water coming out. So Q is the same in both places. You could call it Q in, you could call it Q out, but it's just Q because the volume's not changing, so Q isn't changing. And then you have an input of your chemical and you have some output of your chemical. And the key thing about the, one, the mixed reactor, the well-mixed reactor, is that it's well-mixed. Right? And so the idea is that the concentration is the same here, as it is here, as it is here, as it is there, as it is there. Everywhere in this one box, you have the same concentration. And that makes the math really easy. So within this volume of water, you have some mass of your concentration M, mass of your chemical, excuse me, M. And the concentration of your chemical is therefore M divided by V. So you got mixing, and then you have other processes that might be causing your chemical to disappear. And those we could call reactions, right? They, they might not be technically reactions. They might be volatilization. They might be settling with particles, but we'll still call them reactions, even though maybe chemical bonds aren't broken or formed. And so the total, the R total, the total of all the reactions ex explains the mass that's lost. So there's two ways you can lose mass, either through these reactions or by flowing out with the output. Those are the only two things that can happen to your mass. Now, I'm going to show you this fancy schmancy video. But first, I have to turn off my pen. OK. So this is a video of a CSTR at startup. So this, in this particular uh, model, uh, what they have is they have this phenolphthalein uh, reaction indicator and they're going to add a chemical, they're going to add something to change the pH, which will cause the, the purple to turn clear or white. Uh, but the idea is that I want you to see what the reactor looks like at startup. So it's a tank reactor and it's continuously stirred. Here's the stirrer. Now this is a very short video, it's only eight seconds, so watch closely as the purple disappears. So you start adding the chemical, you can see it's turning white, it's turning white, and then pretty soon, boom. Now, once it hits that point where it's all, where it's all clear or white, right there is where we could consider this thing to be now at steady state. At startup, it wasn't at steady state, but it got there pretty quickly. So now this thing is, is at steady state. So it's a continuously stirred tank reactor, a CSTR, and the concentration of the chemical is now the same everywhere in this CSTR. So, you know, this is a beaker in a lab, um, but if you think on a huge scale, you can think of this as, you know, Lake Erie. Uh, and then the question of, how, well, how well mixed is Lake Erie? Then that's a good question. You do have tides and things that move water around, um, but the, the assumption that your entire lake is well mixed is, meh, you know, it's an assumption. Uh, it, it helps the math, it makes the math work out really nice, but, you know, it's an assumption, and we're, I don't know if it's necessarily 100% true. Okay, so the mass balance on the reactor is dmdt. This I'm sure you've seen before, Dr. Eukrid loves this. 
for you graduate students in the audience, you better know these equations when you take your qualifying exam because I guarantee he is going to ask you about them. So dm dt, the change in mass over the change in time, is equal to the inputs minus the outputs minus any reactions that are causing your stuff to disappear. So if you go through and divide everything by V, if the volume is constant, you can do this, and then instead of the mass, you're going to get the concentration here, I over V, O over V, and R over V. So there's a couple of simplifying assumptions that might be helpful. Uh, we can assume that the output of your chemical is just the flow rate Q times the concentration of your chemical in the reactor. And since concentration is M over V, we could write this thing Q over V, right? So Q is a flow rate of like meters cubed per day. Sorry, that's a really terrible, uh, terrible thing. Q would be like meters cubed per day divided by V, which is meters cubed. So this ratio has the units of one over time, which are the units of a pseudo first order rate constant, which we will call K sub W, which is the flushing or dilution rate, okay? And then the other simplifying assumption we'll make is that all reactions are first order. Again, we don't have to make this assumption, but making this assumption makes the math much easier. And like I said, I can't handle anything that's not first order. I just give up. I run away, run away, I can't handle anything. If it's not first order, I'm, I'm out. I'm not doing it. And as long as you're assuming that all the processes are first order, that means that the rate at which your chemical disappears are is some pseudo first order rate constant times the mass of the chemical in the reactor. And so the total could just be the sum of all those pseudo first order rate constants. So the mass balance on the reactor becomes dm dt equals the inputs minus the stuff that leaves due to flushing, the stuff that gets flushed out, uh, and the minus the total that disappears due to reactions. And since these are mo both multiplied by m, we could group them over here. And then we could say, okay, at steady state, steady state is when dm dt is equal to, you guessed it, zero. So if this is equal to zero, then the mass at steady state, which is the little infinity symbol here, the mass at steady state is the input divided by the sum of all the rate constants, the flushing rate constant and all of the other rate constants that are causing your chemical to disappear. So we could calculate, for example, a time to steady state. Remember that would be the natural log of 0.05, which happens to be three, divided by the sum of the rate constants. And so this, this is an important number, the time to steady state, um, we could see in that little YouTube video I showed you that the time to steady state for that reactor was very short. It was a few seconds, right? The whole clip was only eight seconds long. Um, but the time to steady state for something like Lake Michigan is very different. The time to steady state in Lake Michigan could be years. And that's an important thing to know because if you suddenly stop polluting Lake Michigan, it will still take you years for that pollution to flush its way out and, this, and the lake to reach a new steady state. So this time to steady state is a very important parameter to know about the system that you're dealing with. Okay, so that's all we're gonna say about the uh, one box model, but we're gonna use that over and over and over again. I guarantee you are going to use this equation many, 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 many times uh, as we go through the rest of the semester. So memorize this equation, get to know it. It's your bestie, bestie, bestie friend. Yay, look, she can draw with her mouse. Okay, get to know this equation because it's your best friend and you will use it a lot as the semester goes forward.